the interesting thing is that just up to the day before Bernie Madoff was indi indicted, he was the top trusted name on Wall Street. He had the most stellar credit rating. He was the head of the credit rating agency for uh, those types of funds that he was rated under. Um, and the next day, he's a crook. So he's... You can see these things happen throughout mm -hmm. human history. The, changing the form of money you use doesn't change that. But if you change the architecture of money and you make it less necessary uh, and um, less useful to concentrate the money in the hands of third parties, that has an impact. And so, so that's one of the issues with this something like Mt. Gox or mm -hmm. with any banking system yes. other than the Bitcoin system. With, with Yes. I mean, the problem is the counterparty risk. If you give your money to other people, the entire reason we have oversight in banking is because of the simple truth that if you give your money to other people, eventually they'll try to steal it. Uh, <laughs> that's it. And the only reason they, they don't, because someone in the bank is going to have a tremendous need, a tremendous gambling problem, uh, an addiction, um, something, right? Mm -hmm. Or just have a lack of empathy and, and social socialization and just be, you know, crooked. Uh, crooked. But uh, they don't even have to be crooked. They can make a mistake in trading and try to cover it up with customer money. They can have a, a, a debt. Their, their parent may require an expensive surgery that they can't afford. There's lots of reasons why people commit financial fraud. And not all of it is because they're just greedy, evil assholes. But... Right. But the bottom line is that all of the oversight system we have in banking, which, by the way, fails again and again and again and again to protect uh, regular people from these thefts, all of these systems we have exist for that one reason. So the answer is not build better systems to watch the people who hold your money. The answer that Bitcoin gives is don't let others hold your money. Hold your own money. And then you don't have this problem. There was a recent investigative report about um, a, a firm in Georgia, I want to say it's Atlanta, that has a ridiculously high rate of success with investments. Mm -hmm. And they interviewed the guy who runs it and you know his reasons for why they're so wildly successful and they make so much more money than anybody else were very suspect. And they're closing in on this guy like, what's going on over here? And they think that... Not only is the Bernie Madoff model not just Bernie Madoff, but they, they think that it's common and that there's a lot of people they, that might be supplementing legitimate investments with a pyramid scheme and that it's been a standard operational model for a lot of these firms because they've been able to pull it off. What we've seen again and again throughout history in the area of finance is that when there's a recession, when there's a drop in income and profitability for everyone, uh, that event is actually really good for capitalism. What it does is it washes out the frauds. It washes out the failures. It washes out the unprofitable businesses. It's a great cleansing event, right? Because the tide recedes and suddenly you see who's not wearing swimming trunks, right? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> We knew there was something fishy going on right. under the water, but... Um, <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. When that happens in, in Wall Street, all of those companies that were simply reinvesting the, the recent gains to, to pay the people who were withdrawing their money or the retirees that are supporting in their pension fund, etc., suddenly they, don't, they can't do that anymore. They're washed out of the business. Uh, badly performing businesses, uh, unprofitable businesses, all of these things get washed out. We haven't been doing this in this country for the last three decades. Instead, what happens is every time there is a recession, the Fed steps in uh, or the government steps in. And basically, they pump water to raise the tide again, right, as much as possible. And that means that a lot of the crooks float from recession to recession without getting revealed. Worse, it encourages that kind of behavior. And so you get all of these businesses whose only ability to make profits is when the interest rate is zero and there's $20 billion a month being injected by the Fed. And their business model is take that and lend it to consumers for $29.99 APR, mm. <laughs> right? Or do payday loans or subprime loans or subprime auto student loans, mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. You need a cleansing event to wash out 
the fraud. Um, I, I like the example of a forest fire. If you suppress all of the small fires, what happens is eventually you build up a lot of undergrowth in the forest. A small fire doesn't kill the trees. It just cleans out the undergrowth. You keep putting out the fires, which we've seen since the 70s here in the States. You let all of the undergrowth grow up. Then when a fire comes through, it's not just a little forest fire. It's a raging inferno. Now you can't put it out, and it burns the trees and destroys the soil, sterilizes the top foot of soil. We've seen this happen, right? And so this is now happening in terms of our economy, which is that all of this... Um, bubble creation doesn't get washed out in a recession. More stimulus, more funding. The Federal Reserve pumps more money into the economy. Trillions of dollars since 2008. And all of the stimulus, where does it go? It goes into inflating not one bubble. We had real estate, but now we have real estate and subprime auto and student loans and, 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 and bonds and stocks and currencies all inflating at the same time is it possible to do a controlled burn for the economy like that's what they're doing in some places where they want to uh deal yes. with the issue that you know you're talking about how there's stop forest fires that's theoretically part of the mandate of the federal reserve which most people don't realize is a private corporation owned by the banks and not a government agency yeah that's a tricky name yes the federal reserve Isn't it? because it has yes. nothing to do with that yeah yeah it's kind of gross. Yeah. In fact, um, I can't name, say, my publishing company for the book, the the, the federal publisher. Um, they won't allow me to put the word federal in the, the name of my company, as you they can... shouldn't, right? But in order to create a, an organization like that, you need an act of Congress. Uh, in fact, actually, what you need is an act of Congress passed in the middle of the night on a recess, which is exactly how they passed the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. That was a long ass time ago. Yep, it's so ridiculous to keep that name. But there is federal ammunition. I should just say that you can buy bullets. <laughs> a company called Federal Ammunition it has nothing to do with the federal government. Interesting. It's just a good, good company to buy bullets from. Mm -hmm. Um, it just seems like the the controlled burn idea. How would you apply that to the economy? I mean, if what what we're talking you about, you raise the interest rates. You raise them. Yep. Uh, which drains the which drains the swamp, raise the interest rates. Basically, the interest rate controls the cost of money. If you make money more expensive, mm -hmm. then those who borrow it have to have a pretty good rate of investment in uh, re return on their investment to invest it. Right? Otherwise, they don't borrow money. That's an extremely unpopular idea, though. Right? So, how do you get that across? Oh, well, it's an it's an unpopular idea because um, it benefits savers instead of debtors right? right so if you if you have savings it's a great idea i remember a time when i could get a certificate of deposit for my savings in the bank and i could get three percent a year three percent a year right i can't get 0.3 percent now so savers get wiped out if you're a retiree who's got all of their money in savings right now the return you're getting on those savings isn't enough to cover your cost of living so your money basically is shrinking and that's a tax on savers that um, benefits debtors, especially very large debtors like the federal government. Yeah, it's such a complicated system that for the average person that's working all day and, you know, you get home, you have hobbies and family and things that you want to do. It's very difficult to get a grip on exactly how money works. Yes, it is. And it's one of the things I found through my experiences doing these talks that I do. Um, and I talk about that in the book too. The, the whole point of this particular book, The Internet of Money, is why Bitcoin? And I talk about the philosophy behind money, the, the topics of money that most people don't understand. Uh, and what's really astonishing is that here I am, and I'm, I'm talking about the greatest experiment in money um, started in 2008, 2009. And this great experiment is completely unprecedented in the history of money. And I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about 22 central banks simultaneously taking their interest rate to zero and pumping the largest amount of money ever created into the world economy, trying to stop it from collapsing. And that has created the largest bubble in history. And the weird thing is that most people are not even aware that they're living in a time when we are doing this completely unprecedented, 
untested, no one knows where it goes, huge monetary experiment in which two billion people are hostage as part of it, at least, right? And nobody knows where this is going to go, but most economists, mainstream economists, uh, say this doesn't end well. A system like that, which is which is very opaque, which most people don't understand, is the kind of system you want to corrupt, because that's where you can make the most money without anybody noticing. And of course, you know, financial crime is not really prosecuted in this country. Um, in 2008, giant crisis, millions of homeowners kicked out of their homes, illegal foreclosures, robo-signing mills, blah, 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 blah. The only person who went to jail, Bernie Madoff, who stole from the rich. Uh, pretty much everybody else scot-free. Right? It is pretty interesting. It's almost right. like he was just a scapegoat. Well, he was obviously a crook. He obviously was obviously a, a crook. Guy. He was obviously a crook. But and a sociopath or something. Surrounded by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crooks in the same scale and giant investment banks that are just as corrupt. And we don't see that, right? You You can get... You can get um, pulled over for a busted taillight and thrown in jail in plenty of the states in this country for six months for having an herb in your car. Um, and at the same time, you can put a million people out of their homes through straight up fraud with mountains of evidence and emails and things like that. And they're untouchable. That system, the, the problem isn't the fact that there is fraud. The problem is that the, fa the system itself is fragile because of that. And if it was just them going out of business when the fragile system has problems, when it has hiccups, as it did in 2008, that's fine. But it's not just them going out of business. It's a generation of kids who leave college with nothing waiting for them but a McJob. Um, and, you know, coming into a generation where their parents could get by with one income in a household and now three jobs each in a household of two and you can't afford to buy a car, let alone a house, right? So we're part of the new sharing economy. And what is the sharing economy? It's the I can't own anything because I can't afford anything economy. <laughs> so that whole generation is now suffering because of that fragility of the system, and the fragility hasn't gone away. But I don't want to dwell too much on the negative, right? Because there, the, the thing that I find positive and interesting about Bitcoin is that it serves a global society. It is truly global, transnational money. There's plenty of places in the world that have it worse than the US. There are some places that have it better financially. Um, but it really is quite an incredible concept to be able to have this money that can operate on a global basis. And with that, the opportunities to uh, buy and sell and trade and uh, invest and borrow internationally. The fact that what we did with the fundraising here to fundraise for those wells, right... I, we don't know if that was just people in the U.S. donating. It wasn't. I can guarantee you there were people from all over the world donating. That's almost impossible to do with traditional uh, payment systems. You could have then sent that money directly to where the wells were being built. Again, anywhere in the world. And that's really exciting to me. People are uncomfortable with Bitcoin because it represents changing one of the fundamental ancient technologies of civilization, money. And we've only changed that technology four or five times in the history of human civilization. We've gone from bare bones barter systems, here's a goat, give me three chickens, right? To systems of precious metals um, and other nice objects, feathers, shells, etc., to exclusively precious metals, to precious metals stamped with the faces of kings. And then at some point, around the, the 15th century, you start seeing certificates of deposit for, for precious metal being exchanged, paper notes. The, I have a deposit of gold there. I'm not going to move the gold from my deposit to your deposit. I'll just give you the piece of paper that says you're now the owner. And paper money is introduced. And, and then plastic in the 1950s, uh, diner's club, uh, traveler's checks, and the first credit cards. And if you think any of these transitions were smooth, 
none of them was smooth. You go to someone who's been using precious metals for 10 generations and you say, hey, this piece of paper is money. They're like, "Mm -mm. (laughs) mm-mm. Give me something shiny that I can bite. That's money. This paper, I don't know who you are. Go away. How long is that transition? 400 years. Wow. Right? Until broad acceptance of paper money. 400 years with huge resistance. It took almost 40 years for credit cards to go mainstream. With Bitcoin, we're going to do it probably in less than 20. You think so? But it's been almost 10. It's It's been been seven. Seven? Yeah. And it's accelerating very much. I think in some countries you're going to see either Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency very similar or based on Bitcoin be used as uh, commonly as a national currency. We're not looking to displace national currencies. We're looking to supplement them. I think the idea being that people will get comfortable using multiple currencies, just like many places they are. If you're operating um, you know, between the border of Kenya and Tanzania, for example, you're probably going to use four different currencies, Kenyan money, Tanzanian, US dollars, and euros easily, possibly also South African Rand. So you've got four or five currencies, and you can stop a a four-year-old in the streets and ask them what the exchange rate is, and they'll tell you, right? Because they trade for their parents in merchant stalls along the border, and they have people coming with all kinds of different currencies. It's not that difficult to assume that there's digital currencies in that future, either there or in a major modern metropolis where people are using... Bitcoin to transact online, uh, to buy things, um, virtual things, uh, music, video, things like that, where you want to make very, very small payments where credit cards are not suitable, and use Bitcoin as well as their normal currencies. 